Hello everybody, welcome to Blue Marble Science. Today we're going to talk about the Cavendish uh, experiment and what old Henry actually did measure. And we're going to look into how flat earth gets it wrong again and again and again. Flat earth community just refuses to believe in the existence of gravity. And they either totally dismiss the Cavendish experiment or they horribly misrepresent it. As usual, they don't have any idea what they're talking about, so let's take a look at this and maybe call out Sleeping Warrior in the process. Now, I don't think we're really going to need our oven mitts today, but you never know. You might want to keep them handy just in case. And uh, Gladys, are you ready? <coughs> well, let's light this little dumpster fire and have some fun. The so-called Cavendish experiment was actually devised by a guy named John Mitchell, who uh, uh, passed it on shortly before his death to another gentleman who ended up giving it to uh, Henry Cavendish, who performed the experiment over about a year period, uh, somewhere in uh, 1797 to uh, 1798 time frame. The important thing that we're going to cover today is, is to try to get the point across that the experiment was intended to determine the density of the earth. That's what it was for, nothing else. I've heard people on both sides of this argument get it wrong, and it's time we understood exactly what we're talking about here. Now, I'll put a link in the uh, description uh, where you can go and actually download this, the entire Cavendish uh, report if you wish. I'm going to skip through this uh, and only show a very small part of it. It actually goes on for about 64 pages. Here's the very first page, and let me just read a little bit of this to you. Many years ago, the late Reverend John Mitchell of this society contrived a method of determining the density of the earth. Let me say that again. Contrived a method of determining the density of the earth by rendering sensible the attraction of small quantities of matter. But as he was engaged in other pursuits, he did not complete the apparatus till a short time before his death and did not live to make any experiments with it. After his death, the apparatus came to Reverend Francis John Hyde Wollaston, Jacksonian professor at Cambridge, who, not having conveniences for making experiments with it in the manner he could wish, was so good as to give it to me. So that's sort of the history of it. The idea was to determine the density of the earth. Now, in the little sketch on the right on the top, you see this actually came from the Cavendish uh, 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 manuscript here. Uh, it's a little bit hard to decipher from that diagram, so I included the other little uh, uh, photograph or little uh, diagram that you can find in Wikipedia. And it shows what really is going on. You see the two red masses there, the two red uh, balls on a little beam that is suspended by a torsion wire. And you see two gray masses, larger ones, uh, sitting there. And the idea is simply this. If the, uh, the small beam with the, the small red masses on it is sitting stationary and we move those two large masses in proximity to the small red ones, we're going to get a gravitational attraction. We're going to get a twisting of that torsion wire. And that's exactly how Cavendish uh, ended up measuring the density of the Earth. And I want to read a little bit uh, more of the, some of the opening parts of the book of the uh, paper. And this part that I'm about to read is the part that gets misrepresented uh, consistently by a sleeping warrior. So pay attention to this part. Mr. Mitchell had prepared two wooden stands on which the leaden weights were to be supported and pushed forwards till they came almost in contact with the case. But he seems to have intended to move them by hand. As the force with which the balls are attracted by these weights is excessively minute, not more than one fifty millionth of their weight, it is plain that a very minute disturbing force will be sufficient to destroy the success of the experiment. And from the following experiments, it will appear that the disturbing force most difficult to guard against is that arising from the variations of heat and cold. For if one side of the case is warmer than the other, the air in contact with it will be rarefied and in consequence will ascend while the other side will descend and produce a current which will draw the arm 
sensibly aside. But the part that Sleeping Warrior focuses on is this one fifty millionth uh, statement. All Cavendish was trying to do was impress on the reader how difficult this experiment actually is to conduct and how sensitive the torsion balance has to be. One fifty millionth is the force of attraction of those two small masses. It has nothing to do with the gravitational attraction of the Earth. So let's move forward. Now, Cavendish goes through in the intervening pages uh, between what we just read and this is getting into the summary end of it. He goes through all of his data on 23 different experiments, I think. It's, uh, it's quite a voluminous amount of material to uh, wade through, so we're not going to try to even do any of that. But starting here on this page, this is where he titles it on the method of computing the density of the Earth from these experiments. And he goes through quite a detailed uh, description of exactly how the, how the uh, computations are made. And we'll move on to the next page because it all culminates really in one very simple little equation that says right there, uh, this won't make a lot of sense unless you read all of it, but it's a simple equation that relates the, uh, the time required for oscillations as the, as the uh, large weight is moved in, into proximity with the small uh, mass. The time required between those oscillations squared divided by a constant, which for that experiment happened to be uh, 10,683 uh, times the number of divisions and he had these things marked I think in like two tenths of an inch or something like that the number of divisions anyway of displacement so one very simple formula and then he goes through a, another lengthy uh, uh, discussion on corrections that needed to be made for such things as the very small mass of the rod that held the two small uh, balls and so forth and none of that really made a big difference. But now I want to go back to the the very back end of this thing. Because this is the punchline. This is it in total. Let me read this paragraph because this is everything that was determined. By a mean of the experiments made with the wire first used. And, and let, me, let me stop for a second and point out that he actually used two different torsion wires. Two different sizes of wire. So for the first one, the density of the earth comes out to 5.48 times greater than that of water. And by a mean of those made with the latter wire, the second wire in other words, it comes out the same. And the extreme difference of the results of the 23 observations made with this wire is only 0.75. So that the extreme results do not differ from the mean by more than 0.38 or one fourteenth of the whole, and therefore the density should seem to be determined hereby to great exactness. Henry Cavendish had no idea what an understatement that was. He thought he was within one fourteenth of the actual value. And in fact, he was well within one one hundredth of the actual value. Uh, and it remains to this day one of the most... Uh, remarkable initial experiments anyone ever conducted. So what is it Flat Earth is lying about? They're lying about that 150 millionth. Cavendish determined that the density of the, of the Earth was 5.48 times that of water. That was his sole finding, not 150 millionth of the weight of an object. From Cavendish's density, we can determine the mass of the Earth to be about 5.972 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. And that's based on a known radius of 6.371 times 10 to the 6 meters. We can measure the acceleration of gravity, and we do it all the time. It always comes out 9.81 meters per second squared at, the, at sea level in a vacuum. Always. Calculating the gravitational constant from, the, from what Cavendish did is really pretty simple and let me show you exactly how you can do that. Newton gave us two formulas. One said force is mass times acceleration. The other one said force is the gravitational constant times the product of the masses divided by the square of the distance between their centroids. Now if you set those two equations equal to each other, 
little g, gravitational acceleration, equals big G times the big mass, the mass of the Earth, divided by its distance, uh, the, the square of its radius. In other words, the distance from the center of the Earth to sea level. We can rearrange that to say big G is equal to little g times r squared divided by uh, the mass of the Earth. Cavendish gave us the missing piece. We knew 9.81 meters per second per second. We knew that one. We knew the radius of the Earth, 6.371 times 10 to the 6th. All we needed was the mass of the, uh, of the Earth to go with it, 5.972 times 10 to the 24th. Do that very simple arithmetic, and G is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11th. That's the way it works out. So the Cavendish experiment was pretty simple in concept, but uh, it was very difficult to implement and, and measure accurately. And that was the entire reason that Cavendish made that statement early in the manuscript. He was simply trying to point out to the reader how sensitive that torsion balance had to be. When he said one fifty millionth of the mass of the small ball, it had nothing to do with the acceleration of gravity of the Earth. Only the two masses specific to the experiment. When we start talking about the acceleration of gravity with respect to our weight or the weight of my cell phone, sleeping warrior, we're talking about 100% attributable to gravity, not one fifty millionth of it. And if you're trying to say otherwise, you're simply lying to people. I hope that helps clear things up. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one. Hey, Gladys. We're out of here.